Hello everyone, welcome to another Tools Day Tuesday here at Make. Uh, today I'm joined by Michael Caster. Hi Michael. Hi Eric. So Michael also works for the Maker Shed. Um, I do product development. Michael, what do you do? A lot. Um, get in new products, place new orders, um, place orders in general, all sorts of crazy stuff. Cool. So today, um, up on the blog, Eric Chu, one of our interns, did a review for this cubed silicone heater. Um, and like many of the things going on around here recently, this is meant for 3D printers. So before I go ahead and talk about this um, heater really quickly, uh, we do have some special deals going on. Uh, one of them is in relation to our 3D printing special issue. If you go to makescene.com slash subscribe and type in the code MK3D, you can get a one year of Make Scene, which is four issues, uh, for $24.95, I think. And you get the 3D printing special issue for free. We are also giving away a MakerBot Replicator 1 dual extruder uh, on December 17th, I think. Um, you can enter to win it for free. There's no purchase necessary. Just go to makescene.com slash 3D printer. Sorry slash 3D dash printer dash sweepstakes and uh, you should enter to win it because why not? Um, so this heater pad, uh, Eric reviewed this on the blog today. This is great if you have a printer that doesn't have a heated pad like Michael's new Ultimaker um, and you want to start printing an ABS. This one is actually $20 um, and this will heat up your ABS so you, it won't warp. Uh, according to Eric it's pretty decent. Um, I think he the only gripes he had about it was their lack of documentation, um, but apparently it heated up pretty quickly. The only other tough part about installing this on your machine would be uh, the power involved. You need 12 volts and 350 watts for this one. I think this is the 8 inch square one. They also sell a 6 inch square and a uh, 1 foot square version. Um, both the 6 and 8 inch are only $20. So that's pretty affordable for a heated bed. Um, and I probably wouldn't print on this directly since it's all floppy. I'd probably get a piece of glass or aluminum to put on top. Um, yeah. And Michael, I know you're talking about getting uh, some glass for your Ultimaker. Do you know where would you go to get that? Or Lexan, what were you going to use? Well, I, uh, I have a printer bot and, uh, and the Ultimaker. But for the printer bot, I just went to Lowe's and got the measurements off my heated print bed and just had them cut a piece of one eighth inch just regular glass. Um, and then I got some Kapton tape and put that over top. And uh, then you have to use a little bit of sandpaper to get your prints to stick to it. And uh, that that's worked really well ever since. And it cost me about three bucks. Yeah, I think glass is a pretty good option for um, printing on when it comes to a heated bed and ABS. Yeah, it does a good job at spreading out the heat. And it uh, provides a really flat surface to print on, so you don't have to worry about any warping, kind of like you do with a, just a regular PCB um, heated bed. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. And, and I can see that coming in really handy. I have my printer in my garage, and I've noticed that when it's colder in there, it's not heated, unfortunately. So it takes a long time for it to get heated up properly, and I have to put kind of a blanket or something over top of it, just a, a towel to help it heat up better. So something mm -hmm. with more power like that would be optimal for it. Yeah, definitely. That's a good thing about this. And I, I know, um, def definitely go to uh, the blog, blog.makescene.com, and read Eric's full review. He talks about how long it took to heat up to temperature and um, important things like that. So definitely check out his review on the blog. Um, so what Michael and I are going to be talking about today is the 3D printer tool chain, or what software specifically you need to go from a 3D printed part to, or sorry, a 3D print, a 3D model to a full 3D print part like this. Um, so this is great for a lot of people that are, uh, for example, buying printers for the holidays or um, expect to receive one for the holiday. Um, so definitely stay tuned. I'm going to be going through first one of the newest and um, most flexible software for slicing parts, which is the first main operation you have to do before sending it to the printer. Uh, and this one's called Slicer. So I'll share, do a screen share here so you guys can see it. Um, so this is Slicer. Um, 
the main idea here, like I said, is to take a 3D file and slice it up into layers. So I'm going to load a file here, the owl, actually. Um, and what's cool about Slicer is it's completely open source. It's also fairly quick, and there are tons of different settings that, that you can change. Um, you could also load in a bunch of different profiles. You can see here all these. Oh, you can't see. Never mind. Um, but there's actually a drop down here of all the different printers I've used. Uh, so you can name your profiles and also create different ones for, for different parts. So you may have a profile for printing fast or a printer for, or a profile for printing extremely slowly, etc. So this is the main uh, window. I am just going to kind of breeze through the really important features here. Um, this, this is called the player. And what you can do here is manipulate the parts you add. So you can add multiple parts, um, rotate them, uh, scale them all to whatever you want. Um, that was just 105%. Um, and of course, it, it does all the auto arranging. So as you add a bunch, it'll um, arrange it properly. And you can also drag in different parts from, from elsewhere. So you don't have to print all the, the same part. Here I've added a uh, Nautilus gear, um, and I'm going to re remove some of these owls. So I have room. I do an auto arrange. And another really neat feature that I haven't seen in another slicing program is that when you get an assembly like this Nautilus plate, you can actually split it up into its multiple STLs. So you just hit split, and it splits it up into the four different parts. So that's useful if you, say, wanted to print an extra uh, gear or so. So um, it's really flexible when it comes to part manipulation and arranging them on the plate, which is really nice. Great. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. And actually, before I go any further, um, since this software is so complex and there's so many different options, I want to share with you guys um, a make project I recently wrote about it. Um, can you see that, Michael? Yeah. Yep, you're good. So if you want a really, really, really detailed look into all the different settings, go on Make Projects or Google and type this in, Getting Started with Slicer. Remember, there's a 3 instead of an E in Slicer. Um, so here I go through pretty much every single um, setting, what it means, what it'll do. Um, so in this Hangout today, I'm just giving you guys a general idea, but this is great if you want a really detailed tutorial on how to use the program. So now I'll jump back in and continue. Um, so this plater is actually pretty self-explanatory, but this is where it gets complex in the print settings. So um, I'll just kind of go through the, the really important stuff here. Layer height you'll see in every single slicing program you use. Um, this is the, the height between layers. So uh, 0.1 millimeter layers are extremely fine, 100 microns. Um, so you may, if your printer can handle it, end up with a part that is really smooth and really nicely done, but it will take twice as long to print as a part with 0.2 millimeter layers. Um, so when it comes to just starting out, I'd probably recommend around 0.25 or 0.2 millimeters um, for a layer height. Would you say that's accurate, Michael? Yeah, and just to kind of tell, give people an overview too, um, a 3D printer, it works by just printing things in layers and it takes your object and just slices it. So these are the settings that kind of get basically the thickness of each layer that stacks on top of each other to build your part. And the smaller the or the lower the resolution, the finer um, your print's going to be. Of course, it'll take longer, but you'll have a better, better looking part at the end. And then uh, for speed, you can make the layer height taller. Yep. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that overview. I should have done that earlier. Um, no problem. Another um, neat uh, feature here are the perimeters. So this is how many times your, your machine will um, go around the outside of your part, the outline. Um, so this is what you see at the end, so it's pretty important. Most people use more than one perimeter. You can do two or three. Um, that's pretty important. Um, this is also a big one in fill. Your fill density is how filled in your part will be. So if this was at um, 1 or 100%, your part would be just 100% plastic. But um, most people, I'd say, go between 10 and probably 40% for most parts. 
Um, on average, I probably do maybe 15 or 20 percent. Um, you shouldn't ever really need to go above 60 percent just because it will take forever. Um, so 15 percent is probably good. You can also select different fill patterns. Um, and all these are more special features. Uh, the other neat thing about Slicer that not a lot of programs have are a bunch of different speed settings. So you can do your perimeter speed, a uh, special speed for smaller perimeters, so it'll slow down when it's doing really tough features, um, as well as your infill speed, which you can typically do pretty quickly, um, and bridge speed, which is when you're filling a gap over air, uh, as well as travel speed, so just moving from extrusion to extrusion. Um, you can also do a skirt, which is just a, a single extrusion around your part before you start to kind of prime the extruder, as well as generating support material. Uh, if you have tough overhangs, you can add notes. Um, Slicer also recently added support for multiple extruders, which is still pretty new in the consumer world of 3D printing, but this is, uh, I'm sure, will be used more in the future, um, as well as some other advanced stuff. Um, and these are probably the most important settings. Um, it's really important that you get your filament diameter right. I was recently printing on an Ultimaker and had no idea what was going on until I realized that, oh, I'm not using 1.75 millimeter filament, I'm using 3 millimeter, and I just changed this one setting and fixed everything. Ooh. So it's, it's really important that you get this right. Uh, and if you have a pair of calipers, it's um, even better to measure it and just get as accurate as you can. And uh, what I usually do is measure it several times throughout. Just I pull out about a meter and just measure it several times throughout and just take an average of it. That way yeah. you can kind of kind of know for sure about how big it is. And yeah, I yeah. use a cheap pair of digital calipers that I got from, I think, Harbor Freight. Yeah, that's definitely a good idea. Um, no matter how um, all these filament suppliers will say either 1.75 or 3 millimeters, but the plastic itself is almost, or in my experience, never exactly 1.75 or 3 millimeters. Yeah, and it will um, vary from shipment to shipment, too. Right. So if you have one roll that was you know, 2.89, your next batch might not be that. It might change. Yeah, and uh, like Michael said, it's also important to take a bunch of different readings and average along the way because it will um, change among the length of the spool as well. So a lot of, uh, for PLA printing, um, filament fans are becoming popular, so cooling the plastic as it comes off. Um, and Slicer has this really great uh, cooling feature that kind of gives you this, this whole rundown of what the printer will do. Um, and you can adjust all the settings down here that will uh, change how it cools the plastic, depending on the time it takes to do a layer and all that stuff. Um, here's where you put in your printer settings, so your bed size. Um, the center where you want your part to start, as well as if you have more than one extruder. And here you can do custom G-code. So say you wanted to um, write your own G-code to do infinite prints or have your extruder wipe the, um, the nozzle to, to clear off the plastic before it starts a print. Uh, you can put that in here. As well as um, NG code so to, for example, here, I, uh, cut the temperature and then disable the stepper motors. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a quick overview of Slicer. Um, like I said, it is open source and pretty popular. So it's get yeah, it being developed now. And I know uh, Wolfsbot has sponsored um, Sound, who's the main developer of Slicer, and um, he's doing really great things. So definitely check. That and they're, out. they're updating it constantly. It seems. Yeah. They're doing a great job with it. Like, it's very active. Yeah, really, really quick updates. Um, that was actually one of the reasons I wrote the Make Project is because I found, or you actually told me about a, a, a tutorial online called Slicer is Nicer, which is a really good tutorial back from January. Um, but it's changed it's so much a couple since, versions then. since then. Yeah, so that's what, why I wrote the Make Project. Um, all right, now I guess we can jump into the next kind of software. And I know, Michael, you have experience with, with this one, so I'll probably be asking for your your opinion as we go. Um, sure thing. As I'm pulling this up, do you want to explain what comes after slicing? And what... Sure, yeah. Slicer just generates G-code for your machine, and G-code is what the machine interprets uh, 
basically it's a set of X, Y, Z coordinates and uh, just motions for your extruder to follow. So you take that code and then you have to send it to another program that drives your machine. So it's kind of like the uh, printer driver, if you will, for like a regular printer. But this is a little bit more complex because it's, it's driving a, uh, a 3D printer. Um, and it, you can use the same kind of thing for CNC use. Like it's also called a, like a machine controlling program. Mm -hmm. So you can just load your uh, G code up that Slicer generates. And then you uh, just adjust your, most of the time it's already adjusted with uh, you uh, set your calibrations in the Slicer program. That, so that's already in your G code. Um, you're going to want to preheat everything first. So go ahead and set your heater. Um, your heater controls are kind of down underneath the uh, XYZ movement panel. Right here. Um, so the heater is your extruder. And then bed, if you're going to print ABS plastic, you want to get that heated up. And it usually, I usually let it go for about 20 minutes or so and just yeah. make sure everything's nice and hot first. And then uh, it, most of the time in G-Code, it will automatically home all your motors. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do it manually, you can just click on the little home buttons Yep. And it will or work. if you want to home your... just, just one axis, you can do that with, with these, yeah. um, which is nice. Yep. And then, and then uh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, and then you uh, just load up your file and hit print. And with any luck, your machine will go ahead and, and start printing the first layer and just kind of take it from there. Yep. So I'm not, I don't have any G code prepared, so I'm not going to load a file here. But um, it is really that simple. Once you get... Once you get past the slicing and you have G code, uh, a program like this, which I've heard many different names, um, printer interface, print run, proner face, um, this is a, a great program that will run lots of different machines. One thing to watch out for, um, make sure you have the right port selected. Uh, you probably be a USB port. Um, also the baud rate. Um, this is a, an important setting. A lot of the times, in my experience at least, a lot of them are at 115K. Uh, have you found that as well, Michael, like with your printer bot? Yeah, the, the ones I use are one, uh, one thousand, or whatever it is. One yeah, 115. Yeah. Uh, I think most are like this, but if, if you can't get your printer to work, definitely check out the baud rate. That may be why uh, you're having some problems. Um, but when it comes to the, the printers we sell in the maker shed, this will run all of them, and we actually, I recommend that you guys use this one for printing with all the machines except the Affinia and the MakerBot since they have their own software. But for everything else, go ahead. I was going to say, if it's not connecting right, make sure your machine's on and that the USB cord is plugged in. I've done that a couple of times and the machine will be off and I don't realize, like, why isn't it, why isn't it connecting? And it's just because it's off. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, definitely check all that stuff. Uh, another cool thing you can do in this is... Um, if you check this box, monitor printer, it will update the, the temperature as, it's, as it heats up. If you don't check that box, you have to hit check temp, um, and then it'll pop up on this text box. You can also, another cool thing about this is Slicer is built in. So I've actually never used Slicer in here, but if you go to settings, slicing settings, you can adjust your all, all your Slicer profiles. So then you only need one application that does it all which is really nice. Yeah, that is nice. That's what I use. I just go to load file, load the STL file, and it just pops open Slicer. Um, yeah. I don't think there's not much integration. It just kind of launches the launches it when you load an STL file. Okay. So, but still, you only need one application that way. I don't really know why I, I have them separate then. Um, <laughs> another neat thing about this is there is a, a G-code viewer built in, so when you load G-code, you can... Um, cycle through the layers and everything, which is really neat. That's handy, too. And there's a bar graph that shows up on your uh, right-hand si right side there, and it gives you, uh, kind of tells you how long you have to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I found that, really long print. yeah, have you found that the um, time estimates are accurate at all? Because I found that they're usually pretty bad. Uh, it, it puts you in the ballpark, but, yeah, it's going to be, like, plus or minus you know, half an hour or something like that. Yeah, and they usually start off, like, wildly wrong. Um, so it may say, like, 16 hours to start, and then as it goes, it'll get more and more accurate. Yeah, and it also gives you, like, a filament estimate, how much filament you're going to be using, and I don't know if that's right or not. I've never bothered to measure it. Yeah. Um, but you, you can tell if your part's 
it's also a good way to troubleshoot because you may have blown up your SPL to a bigger file without knowing it. So if you're like, oh wait, this thing's going to take you know three days to print, there's probably something wrong. Yeah, and there are good, there's a good number of free G code viewers out there. Um, if you look at my slicing make project, I use one. Um, I forget what the URL is, but it's a free in-browser G code viewer that actually does animation um, to show you what path the printer will take and how large your part is. So that's all really useful. Um, now, since we still have some time left, um, I did say before that Print Run will work with all the printers except the Affinia and the MakerBot. Um, I would recommend it for all of them but those two. So if you bought an Affinia and you have an Affinia, um, you'll be using the Affinia software, uh, which looks like this. So I can run through this quickly. Um, this software is really easy to use. Um, it will automatically recognize which printer you have plugged in, and then you just do file, uh, open, It'll open up an STL, in this case I have an OWL. Um, and the neat thing about this is it does all the auto placement like Slicer does. Um, and it, it does look like that's off the bed, but it's actually correct. If you do auto placement, it, it will get it right. Um, you can also do scale and rotation operations here. Um, and let me load in another part. So if I load in the Nautilus plate, you can see it pops up here, and then you can select different parts. So I'm going to, going to do auto placement. Yeah, so we're not going to fit all these on the bed. Um, but this is, this is a really easy software to use. Another neat thing about this is that it's all, it slices and generates G-code on its own. So you only need this software, and then when you're ready to go, you just do 3D print up here. Um, and once, when your printer is plugged in, it'll beep and start heating up. And then you'll see down here by status, it will show you how many layers it's sliced. And then it'll beep again and tell you it started printing. You hit OK. Uh, and then a neat thing about the Affinity is you can actually unplug it from the computer once all the data is sent to it. So once it starts printing, you can just unplug it and pull your computer away, uh, which is really nice. But this that software is, great. is yeah. Um, but this software is really, really easy to use. It makes it really easy to get started. Um, yeah, I had never used a 3D printer before, and uh, I was out at the at Make Labs, and they had an Affinity, an Affinity set up. And uh, it took me about three minutes to figure out how to import an STL file, um, use that program, and have it printing on the printer. So it was amazingly easy to use. And I, I have spent time with CNC stuff, but never with, uh, never with any 3D printing programs. And it just blew my mind how easy it was. Yeah. I think, in general, um, the two programs I went through first, Slicer and On Our Face, are take a little bit more work. You have to tweak some settings um, and like actually connect your printer and select the right water rate. Um, so it's a little more DIY, but Affinia and the next software I'll go through MakerWare are both um, a lot easier to use, uh, especially for someone that's completely new to the 3D printing world. So now I'm going to start, uh, or I can quickly run through MakerWare software, which is useful for all MakerBots, and we get some crazy loop cool. on there. Um, let's see, move that. So this is MakerBots new software called MakerWare. Um, this is also really, really easy to use, and will work with any MakerBot. Um, I haven't used it with any non-MakerBot printer, but if you have a MakerBot Replicator 2, or Replicator 1, Thingamatic, etc., this will work just fine. So you go up to Add File. I'm going to find an STL. Let's do the Nautilus plate. So there's, you can see it's really easy to import an STL file. And uh, like the Affinia, this does all its own slicing and G-code generation uh, in this one application, uh, which is really, really nice. Um, and then you have and your it looks pretty, too. Yeah. The mountains in the background, the green grass. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you have all your controls over here. Um, you can change your views. It's kind of like a CAD program in a way. Um, and you have all your move commands. So I actually like, oops, let me change my view here. Um, if you select move, you can just drag it, and it shows how far you're moving in each axis, um, which is really nice. 
Um, and you can also add multiple parts. Let me add another uh, owl here. There it is. So I'm going to move the owl over here. Um, and of course, you can do center, um, put it on the platform if it's not, um, and all that nice stuff, or just move it by hand like I'm doing. Um, actually, I'm a real fan of how this one looks, especially when you do things like rotate. Um, it just looks really nice. And it's so uh, smooth, too. Yeah, um, and you can scale and all this good stuff. So let's move this over here. So yeah, as you can see, it's really, really self-explanatory. Um, so from here, you could save this STL, um, but I'm going to hit Make It. Uh, no. And it should, so here we go. So now I can select my printer, Replicator 2, two um, or Replicator Single. Um, so I guess this doesn't work with the Thingamatic or other. Um, you can also choose to export as just G-code. This is what you would do if you had your printer plugged in uh, to your computer. S3G is the file type you use if you wanted to put the G-code on an SD card before plugging it into your replicator. So I'll do S3G here. Um, now, if you have a replicator too, you're printing in PLA. Um, and then the other neat thing about um, MakerWare, like I said, is it has its slicing built in. So MakerBot wrote their own slicing software called Miracle Brew. That's really quick. Um, and they have three preset settings here for slicing. And you can also just check a box for doing a raft or support material. Um, so this is great for beginners since you don't really have to worry about all that crazy stuff. You can just um, select one of these. Um, but if you wanted to go into more detailed stuff, you can do show advanced um, and select the slicing software. So for you people that have used Replicator G before, which is MakerBot's old software, you can use Skyforge, which is the old um, Python-based slicer, um, which is notoriously slow. Um, but works really well and generates good paths. Or you can use the new one, Miracle Group. Um, again, you can select the quality or do more detailed stuff like your infill, layer height, number of shells. Um, you may see shells um, or perimeters. They're both the same. Um, and you can see if you um, move over these, they give you a nice description, which is cool. And then your temperature. Um, Michael, do you want to advise temperatures to use for the different plastics? Sure. I usually use ABS at about 220, um, like right around there. Sometimes with different colors, you have to play with it a little bit until it starts flowing just right and you don't have any air bubbles or and it, uh, it actually sticks to your build platform. Um, just go in like two or three degree increments. It's amazing how much just little changes can make. Yeah. And uh, PLA normally starts melting about 180 or so, but uh, I also print that at at 220, um, and that it flows really well at that temperature, and it seems to stick just fine. So I normally stick around 220 with everything. Yep. If you guys have a, a MakerBot replicator too, you'll note that um, the default temperature for PLA is also high. I think it may actually be 230, um, which is really high for PLA. But like Michael said, you can't really hurt it by um, running it that hot and um, just experiment. Temperature, um, as long as the plastic is melting, temperature won't have as big of an effect on your print quality as um, these three settings will. Um, but it is really easy to change and um, definitely worth messing with. Um, now, if you're printing in PLA, uh, you don't need a heated build platform. In fact, if you have a rep replicator or two, you don't have a heated build platform. So definitely set this at zero. Um, one thing that I've done a few times in Slicer, uh, for example, when printing with a PrinterBot Junior, is set the build platform temperature to something other than zero. Uh, and upon loading the G-code into PrintRun and pressing print, I noticed that it never started. And that's because it's looking mm -hmm. for a build platform to heat up uh, when there isn't one there. So if you don't have a build platform, it's very important that this is zero. Um, and then uh, you can also set some some speeds here. These um, MakerBot just has these two most important ones, speed while extruding and speed while traveling. Um, you could probably crank this up as, as fast as you really want to go. Um, the Replicator 2 should handle speeds of 
200 millimeters a second while traveling without a problem. Um, and then you can just hit export and it'll export your S3G and then you can put it on your SD card and that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, MakerBot um, has done a really good job of making their software easy to use for everyone. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, before we go, uh, this third coming Thursday, I have my first engineer's choice hangout. Michael will be joining me, and we'll actually be talking about more 3D-related things. Um, but on Thursday, it will be on free CAD and CAM software. So we'll go over things like Tinkercad and 1-2-3-D. Um, and Mike, I'll have Michael talk about some CAM stuff since he owns a CNC machine. Um, and it'll be lots of fun, so definitely join us for that. Um, it will also be very helpful if you're just getting into 3D printing or plan on receiving one this holiday season. So yeah, uh, Michael, thanks for joining me today. Yep, thank you, Eric. Yep. All right, guys. Um, keep watching our, our Google Plus page. We have lots of Hangouts going on, as always, um, weekly ones, and um, there should be some fun new stuff coming in 2013. So stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot.